All right, we had one example remaining that I want to hit on with you so that you can understand how to process this when it's not a linear equation. Uh, when you do have a linear equation, a line like we did in example number four, they, they always work out the same way, right? You're going to simplify the arithmetic, you're going to factor out the constants they have in common, and it will be what you want when you're left over. Now, on this one, you'll notice that our goal, we talked about this in the last one, our goal that we eventually want to get to is x minus 2, right? So when we're starting out with this one, um, let me first um, just tell you again, this is equal to 1, and you can find this using a graph. which we've done it before, right, earlier in this lesson, or tables. Um, so when you're doing this on your homework, make sure that you're showing the graph or showing the tables, not just stating it and leaving me or my grader to wonder, but do they really know why that's that? I mean, like, where did they come up with that value? So um, on this one, it, it is equal to 1. So it starts out the same way when it's quadratic. You're going to start out with x squared. It's minus the 3 and then minus 1, right? So this is sort of what it's looking like minus my limit value, and it's less than epsilon, just like the last problem. Um, the difference is what happens when we actually start to work with this. This is x squared minus 4, and you don't have a constant you get to factor out like you did with the linear one. You actually have a quadratic that factors. So we're not going to see a lot of these, and it's not going to be too intense factoring. It should be basic stuff that you remember. If you don't you need to brush up on your factoring, please do that. But this one is a difference of squares, so it factors as x minus 2 and x plus 2. Okay, now you'll recognize that one of those is the one we want, right? The one we want is that over here on the side, goal is the x minus 2. The x plus 2 one, yeah, I mean, like, what do we do with that? So you might be tempted, and you can, in fact, you know, change this to say x minus 2, absolute value, and x plus 2. Um, and you, what you might be tempted to do is to just divide by the x plus 2 to the other side. The problem is x is a variable. And in order to move it, and it being a variable, um, we, we run into problems because what we're supposed to be finding for delta is a constant. Remember, epsilon is a small number. We don't know what it is, but it's a constant. But x is a variable, so we can't just move the variable to the other side. So we have to do something that looks a little bit like a trick. So what we know is we know that our interval, or not our interval, but our value that we're trying to let x approach is 2. So I'm going to set an interval around that. So we're going to say that x is nearby 2. So next, x is between 1 and 3. Right, 1 and 3. I mean, like, that's nearby to 2. Um, and we can always do that. We just go one in each direction. It's a little bit arbitrary, and if you want to choose something different, you can. But it works. So our interval is going to be from 1 to 3, right? That's an interval and in interval notation. So if you take a look at the values here, between 1 and 3 that you could plug in for the x here. See, we don't want to mess with this part because this part's the goal, right? We want to leave it alone. But we want to replace x with something that's going to give us the biggest value for x plus 2. We want it to be a maximum. So we want x plus 2 to be a max. And of course, the value that makes x plus 2 a max is going to be 3, right? Because when I plug in 3, I'm going to get 3 plus 2 is 5, and that's bigger than anything else on that interval. Um, so this will end up being, um, we'll say, let x equal 3, okay? We can pick anything in there that would make it a max. We're just going to choose 3. So if we let x equal to 3, now I have that x minus 2 that I wanted up here, right? I have 3 plus 2 here, so I've got a 5 there. And we're going to have x minus 2 times 5. My pen and the stylus is not working very well. Um, there we go. We'll just do this instead. Uh, and it's less than epsilon. Okay, so we can divide by 5, so I've got x minus 2 less than epsilon over 5. Okay, so this time epsilon over 5 would be the delta I was looking for. Um, so that's the algebra part, right? That's half of the question. 
and then we write the proof out, and it's going to look just like the last one. It's going to say almost identically the same language, but replacing the function that we have with this. So we know that the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 3 is equal to 1. And we know that because for every epsilon, there exists a delta And the delta, in this case, is equal to epsilon over 5, right? Such that when, and then we've got to go from the bottom up on our algebra part, when x minus 2 is less, to, less than delta, or you could say less than epsilon over 5, that would be fine, then, okay, so when that happens, then we can guarantee that the absolute value of x squared minus 3 minus my limit of 1 is less than epsilon. And we are finished with our proof.